we're setting up a basic user interface here for that people can type something. We will then accept their, or we will collect that information and process it and then give it back to them. So we need to set up a few more things here. Uh, so this part of the idea of today's lesson is many reasons. One of them is, you know, this is kind of be the, the pace of the class and typing the code and making sure your attributes are correct and your um, tags and all that is correct. Uh, it's also going to be important to then stop and check your code and debug it and ask for help and such. And it's also going to be important to think about it in the big sense about when we use someone else's app, it's so easy. I just press the button and it does it. Well, we now are going to be in charge of that. That when we when someone presses our button in our app, it does something. So we have a lot to do to get to that point. Here's one half of it, the input. Uh, the output is, uh, I want for this information that is being asked for, uh, to be collected and then displayed on screen down at the bottom maybe and it'll say welcome John Smith I see your favorite hobby is reading so I want to collect that information and have it say something else and to bring that information together so I want down here somewhere for it to display what is input uh, we will have a placeholder an HTML, an HTML tag whose purpose is often as a placeholder, which then we will use to then fill with the proper information after we process it. So after the form, we'll make a comment here. The div tag is a generic placeholder. So we've got a tag, an HTML tag called div. Opening and closing it, and at the moment it'll be empty. But in this placeholder, we're sort of using it as an anchor that eventually when the person types in their information, we process it. And then on screen, in that placeholder, we display whatever we want it to display. on screen in the browser nothing should appear there it's a generic placeholder that doesn't look like anything until we start to fill it with information or style it with CSS and we'll see if we get to a little CSS a little later because again I would like to make the um, the edges of my field sets not be that long and if you look very very carefully you might notice that there's a this is not properly lined up look at that it's terrible it's like two pixels wrong so we want to fix that as well via CSS, but later. What I want to deal with now is the input, and we have an invisible place where the output will be displayed. Here's when we get into the JavaScript, and here's when we need to get into these attributes that are commonly used of IDs. We need to identify a particular HTML element so that the JavaScript can work with it. JavaScript is very powerful because it can be used to uh, create, edit, or destroy JavaScript, but it can also be used to create, edit, or destroy HTML, and JavaScript can also be used to create, edit, or destroy CSS. So the JavaScript language has power over all of those things, over itself, JavaScript, over HTML, and over CSS. But one of the ways that we can have the JavaScript target an element in the main body is by labeling them with IDs or identifying them with ID attributes. So if you have experience in JavaScript and such, you'll know that there's a variety of ways to do this. If you, if you know other ways, have at it. If you're new to the class, this is one way. So we're giving a unique identifier so that we can then affect it or control it or or um, read it via JavaScript. ID tag is a generic placeholder. We added an ID attribute for the JavaScript to be able to work with it. The ID that I'll call here, I'll call it this. It needs a unique name. 
div results IDs are unique only one element per document may have a certain name they are case sensitive So if I call this div results capital R, and then in my JavaScript I write some code that calls it as div lowercase r, it will not work. It will get errors. So case sensitivity is most important in JavaScript. It's important in HTML and CSS, uh, but it's most important in JavaScript. It does matter uppercase and lowercase. When we wrote uh, some CSS last time, I talked about the three ways we can write it. And when we wrote some JavaScript last time, I wrote about the three ways we can write it. Inline, directly on an element. We can attach JavaScript directly to this input box. And that's inline, and it's the worst way. You don't want to add inline JavaScript, really. Then we've got embedded. JavaScript, which is all our JavaScript in this document in one area. That's why we're, we're about to do it, just because it's easier. And then the third way, the best way, is external, to write our JavaScript all in a separate JavaScript file. I don't want to get that complex just yet, so we're going to write some embedded CSS. It's going to be centralized into one area, and that JavaScript will then be able to read and write into the areas of HTML. So we're going to start our script block. Start script slash script. You can say embedded JavaScript follows. So as long as we're within those uh, two tags, we're in the world of JavaScript. Therefore, we should only write JavaScript code here, writing in JavaScript syntax. So if I try to write you know, something about an input box here, uh, that's HTML. It should not be inside of the JavaScript. We, only can, we can only write uh, JavaScript syntax in here. And as I said, there's a great 500-page book that I recommend that covers HTML and CSS, and there's a great a uh, 600 page book that covers JavaScript that I recommend. Uh, so obviously here we just need to know enough JavaScript to be able to read what the person typed into those boxes and maybe do some fun JavaScript stuff with what they typed and then display it again on screen. Well starting from early on I want to mention um, this concept here, the iffy, you can pronounce it as in as something like this, iffy, which is immediately, imme immediately invoked function expression. There's a longer discussion about exactly what this is that we're about to write. Short answer, it makes JavaScript good. We'll get to the long answer later. Just for the moment, go ahead and type this. Open and close parentheses, open and close parentheses, semicolon. In between the first parentheses, function, open and close parentheses, open and close curly brace. Again, very important to do the pairs. So I had first, open and close parentheses, which is, what is this, shift 9 and 0. Right after that pair is then another pair, open and close parentheses, <coughs> then a semicolon, end of statement, end of command. In between the first parentheses, then I wrote function, no space, parentheses, pair, no space, curly braces, no space. 
And the curly braces are shift square braces, which is next to the P, which is next to the backslash. This is our immediately invoked function expression. It's way too complex, and I want to explain at the moment. Short answer, it makes JavaScript gooder. That's good enough of what I need to say about it right now. All of our JavaScript needs to exist inside of it. Even though we're saying everything inside of these angle brackets is JavaScript, we want to write all of our JavaScript inside of this function, an immediately invoked function expression. Within the curly braces will be all of our JavaScript. I'm going to break the JavaScript, the curly braces I mean, into multiple lines. So make sure it's written properly first. And when you put your cursor between those curly braces, press Enter a couple of times. And now there's going to be an area in between. Write all your JS in here. So it should look like this. You've got your originally opening uh, parenthesis, which should find its pair, which then it's got the opening and closing pair again, semicolon, function, opening and closing parentheses. And then you've got the opening and closing curly brace. And all of our JavaScript, our 1 or 100 or 1,000 lines, are going to be in between those two curly braces. And for the moment, I'll just say that's just the way it is. If you know other ways, it's probably valid. It's probably fine. If you're learning right now, there is no other way. This is the right way. And uh, we're going to use this way. lines. Proof of concept to see that we're writing things correctly. I want to output a message that is created via JavaScript that confirms I've written things correctly so far. Even what we've done right now, you could have problems and it won't work. So it's often a good idea, especially as a beginner, little proof of concept is it working so far have I set up the most basic aspect of things first if I don't get this message I need to stop and fix it we're gonna see if this out if this message is set to the web browser but last time we were here we had a couple of ways to make an output happen we had window.alert and window.prompt this is something else this is console.log <coughs> To see this output, we need to look at the developer's console. Every web browser has built in a special screen for us developers to check messages and feedback and errors. Every web browser has this. Uh, so to see this message, we have to see the developer's console. I'm going to save it and run it in Firefox. Nothing happens, but when you press on the keyboard F12, on the button up on the top of the keyboard, F12, you should get a brand new screen. I'm in Firefox. The screen is at the bottom. If you're in Chrome, it may appear on the right. But mine is Firefox. It says console. If yours says inspector, you go to console. And look at that, ready to rock. Let me pause right there. If you're in if you're in Chrome and it pops up uh, with a different sort of screen like on the right like I said that's Chrome but there's console if I get an error like syntax and such let me do a little pause here to see if that uh, if that's working remember to raise your hand if you need any help
original age. Concept. Uh, this is our basic syntax of JavaScript if we're doing embedded JavaScript, which is that we've got the script tag and then we've got this <coughs> immediately invoked function expression. Once we move into having external JavaScript, we're still going to use this immediately invoked function, this iffy. This is just very standard, common practice for modern, proper JavaScript. Uh, if you've learned JavaScript in other ways and it works, then it's another way, it works fine. Uh, but this is a very common way. Uh, that book that I recommend uh, has it this way plus another way, so just to kind of be consistent with that, this is one way that I like to teach. Uh, the full meaning of this, don't worry about it, we'll get to it later. But for the moment, if you do get your message, we are ready to rock. We are ready to, rock. We are ready to start to see what did the person type into those boxes. And we're going to use this a lot, console.log, let's write a little note here, output to the devcon, the developer's console, only we, the developer, can see this. Not really, obviously, you press F12 on the web browser, it pops up. And if you visit various websites throughout the world and you press F12, you will be able to see the secret developer stuff. This is the basic nature of all websites. Um, all of the code is free to look at and the JavaScript. So the good and the bad about this, what's good about all of, our, all of, this, all of those website 
all of the code being open is we can look at the code of some other website and learn how they did it so that we can do it on our website. We can learn from someone else's <coughs> website to apply it to our own. What's bad about the code being so open is that the code is so open. So whatever code that you write and is out there on a web server, someone could see it. Now eventually our project is going to go on a device, which is a whole different matter. But for the moment, because we're working with uh, the plain version of things, web projects, uh, any website you can open up F12 with any browser and check out the secret developer screen. We use console.log as a way to give ourselves some output. We could have done window.alert and made an obvious pop-up appear, but it's much more common to make one of these sort of silent messages that you would see only if you go to the developer's console, F12. So here we've got the object of console and we've got the method of log. We've got basically where are we doing something, object, and what are we doing, method. So to the console, to the you know, F12 view, we're using a method, we're using a command of log. I'm in Firefox, and when I look at it here, I also get a little cursor down here. Window.alert, and look how it's popping up and giving uh, hints and this is another spot where I can in the browser itself type valid JavaScript one line at a time and when I press enter it processes the JavaScript you might get also other feedback here undefined window dot prompt name this is just fun stuff I'm throwing out there pops up, name, type something, what I type was Jimmy. So here's another way to kind of test JavaScript. This is a sandbox. It's a place where you get back, where you get feedback, but also you can play with JavaScript. And this is also a place that, that gives you, um, you know, as you're typing something, it pops up. Do you mean copy? Do you mean console? Do you mean constructor? Do you mean confirm? Here's another way where I can sort of play around. Add event listener under A, alert, A tab. So every web browser has a version of this. When you press F12 in your browser, you get some sort of console where you can get your feedback or play with JavaScript. If it's invalid JavaScript, it'll say, I don't know what that is. And as this screen gets filled up, Depending on your browser, you may have like a little button that says clear. On Chrome, it's like a little cross out circle. Here it's a trash can, and all it does is just clear that out. Because as we get more and more complex and we get a lot of feedback, this gets kind of cluttered. So it might be useful to clean out the, the, the console to focus on your latest code. So I'll be covering this over and over as we get it deeper into JavaScript, but at the very least, in your browser, I've pressed F12, I've got my console, I have my proof here that I'm kind of on track. Next, what we need to do is start to ask, or we need to start to retrieve what the person has been um, typing into those fields. I want that when the person clicks submit, something to happen. I want that we, um, we start to retrieve what they've typed. Well, as long as we're in the world of the JavaScript, it doesn't really talk to the world of HTML unless we explicitly say so. Whatever we're typing in this script block assumes it's JavaScript and we're dealing with JavaScript. What I want to do is, via JavaScript, go peek at the form where the person typed their name and retrieve what they typed. So I gave us a little hint here that eventually, in this div, we are going to output stuff. And I said that we're going to do it because it's got a unique identifier. We don't have a unique identifier on anything else in the HTML, so it's a little harder for the JavaScript to know what are we talking about. Which form? We've got one form, but what if we had seven forms? Uh, so we need to identify the form <coughs> with an ID attribute. We need to identify the input fields with an ID attribute. That way, with the JavaScript, we can reach in and grab what's in those boxes and do something with them. 
So let's back up to our HTML, and we need to add some IDs. On the line 12 or so, if your line numbers are different, you need to find where your form starts. We will add an attribute of ID, FM user. I'm using that as my identifier that this form is called FM user. Via the JavaScript, I will then be able to pay attention to that form. And it seems like a little overkill for one simple project like this, but when we're later on in a more complex project with three input forms and seven tables or whatever, naming these with unique identifiers can be very helpful uh, for the JavaScript to, to read it or write to it. We're also going to need uh, IDs for those input fields. So go find where you've got your, your last name, your first name, and your hobbies. Input type, name, placeholder required. Let's add ID. Call this in first name. Same thing as the name. That's fine. Same, the for, the name, and the ID can all be exactly the same, and I recommend it. It could be something else if you want, but I recommend you keep those consistent. We need an ID for in last name. And then we'll need the ID for the text area. Text area has an opening and closing tag. We always add attributes to the opening tag, never to the closing tag. So our text area will add ID equals in hobbies. One thing about Notepad++, or just about any good code editor, is that it really helps you see if you've written your code right in the form of like, like this. I've selected my ID, I've highlighted it, and it should also highlight the other instances all throughout my code of, of that. So if I have called this in hobby, and I select it, only that one will select because nothing else in my code is called in hobby. And then that should help me. Oh, I should have actually have called that in hobbies because that's what I called my other rel uh, related attributes in hobbies. Okay, so we'll write notes in the JavaScript in a moment, but the idea here is in order for the JavaScript to be able to talk to or read what is in those input fields, one way is to give them IDs, and therefore JavaScript can see them as objects, because JavaScript is object-oriented programming. It deals with objects, console.whatever, window.whatever, but we want to deal with these objects. So we've named them with IDs, and then we can identify them with JavaScript and work with them. Back to the JavaScript block. This time I'll write the multi-line comment. Create JavaScript objects based on HTML nodes via IDs. So all of those HTML elements, or also, <coughs> they might also be called elements, um, all those HTML codes, those nodes, those elements, those blocks, we can now work with them in JavaScript. We will work with them in JavaScript by using their IDs, so that JavaScript deals with them as objects. So then we can use methods or read properties and work with those fields. Creating global scope objects. 
as opposed to local scope. We'll do local scope a little later. Meaning, the objects may be used throughout our code. That'll contrast with local scope in a little bit for the moment. We're creating these objects, and we can use them anywhere inside of our JavaScript. Um, because we'll, we'll, we'll work with functions, and we'll, look with, we'll work with local scope objects, and we'll get to those nuances. But we need to create an object in JavaScript based on an HTML tag. Simply, after the comment, var l fm user. Space equals. So we'll just write this for the moment, then I'll explain. Document dot get element capital E by capital B ID only capital I, not a capital D. Parentheses semicolon. VAR lets us create an object. One of many ways to create an object. We're creating a JavaScript object. We're making it up. We're calling it LFM user. L short for element. We're creating a JavaScript object based on an element called FM user. Since I'm making this up, obviously, I could name it how I want. We could name it however we want. And many other books or websites or tutorials or classes or instructors have their own sort of naming scheme. They're all right, they're all wrong. This way's right, this way's wrong. It just depends which way you learn first. Be consistent. It depends on if you're in a team and everyone uses a certain way and you're the only one that uses another way, you've got to adapt yourself to be with the rest of the team. So we're creating an object here. And what's going to be based on we're going to assign it a value with equals. It's going to be based on something inside of this HTML document with some ID. <coughs> We're going to get an element by its ID. This has to be spelled exactly correct like I have it here. Get, lowercase, element, capital E, B, Y, capital B, capital I, but not a capital D. That's a very common beginner mistake. Capital I, capital D, that is wrong. Built-in JavaScript is lowercase d, and it's a common cause of problems. In the parentheses, in quotes, we then specify which ID are we talking about. FM user. Note the spelling. Because back at the top, when we gave an ID to our form, <coughs> I called it FM user. So right here, FM user. So basically, how should we say this? Um, checking inside the HTML document. We used the method get element by ID to find the HTML node with the ID attribute of FM user and assigned it to the newly created. JavaScript object L form user. Now we can refer to the HTML code via its JS nickname, we could say. That's the nickname for the form in the HTML block. It's a pointer to the data 
in the HTML block outside of the world of the of the JavaScript code. This is plain old JavaScript here, which can be very wordy. It can be very verbose. A lot of typing. Later on, uh, we're going to use something called jQuery, which is a way for us to write shortcuts. This is the long way. Document dot get element by ID. We'll introduce jQuery pretty soon, a few lessons from now, because jQuery is a way to write JavaScript just a lot shorter, less to remember, maybe a little more efficient, but I don't want to do the easy way yet. Usually I want to do the, uh, the long way, the hard way first, and then we'll look at shortcuts. Okay, so what we have then here is we want to sort of be monitoring when the person clicks go. We want something to happen once the person clicks go. That's known as an event listener. We're waiting for the event that the person clicks go or presses enter for something to happen. So we'll say L form user, LFM user dot add event listener, parentheses. Same syntax again. Object, method. Built in object, built in method. We created a new object. Upon this object that we invented, let's use the built-in add event listener JavaScript method to, to wait for the event of a click. We have many kinds of events. A single click, a double click, a right click, click and drag, loading, unloading. We have many events that are built into JavaScript. Again, 600 page book tells you all about them. But we're waiting for, the, for a certain event to happen, then we do something about that event. Spelling, of course, matters. Capital E, capital L, but not with and. Up here we said, OK, uh, what is the ID in question? Uh, this is various uh, parameters that we're, that we're passing into it. Um, we need some parameters here as well. Uh, we need to say, OK, which, which event? Are we talking about a right click, a double click, a single click? What are we talking about? In quotes, submit. On the event of a submit, um, do something. Wait for someone to somehow press the submit button and then do something. So we can note here. Attach event listener to the object we created representing the form and wait for a submit to occur. Then execute more JavaScript. So we're creating an object representing HTML. We're waiting for a submittal. Once we capture the submit, okay, we run more JavaScript. And that more JavaScript could be check what's in the first name, check what's in the last name, check what's in the hobby. Take all of that and then display it on screen with a fun message or something. So we have several things we want to do after the person submits. So it would be best then to use what is known as a function to execute all of these subsequent uh, steps. So we're going to continue in the parentheses, comma, 
We're waiting for a submit. Once the submit happens, comma, do something else. Function. Open close parentheses. Open close curly brace. Then execute more JavaScript in a named function we create. Add event listeners a method. You can sort of think about it as a function. Get element by ID is a method. It's sort of a function. We're going to invent our own method, sort of. We're going to invent our own function. We're going to invent our own series of steps. Get element by ID is built in. You know, when JavaScript was invented in 1996, they say, we're going to invent a, a function. We're going to invent a, a method. Whenever someone uses this, it does something. It's built in. Add event listener. It's automatically built in. We need to create a function uh, that then executes various steps. So we're going to define our own function. In the parentheses, let's just put event for the moment. I'll explain that in a moment. Within the curly braces, the function that we're inventing is called fn, save name parentheses. Inside of those parentheses is an event. And yes, it will look very confusing in the beginning about opening and closing and which is the right one, and you'll get used to the syntax. Uh, maybe a little bit of repetition in the beginning, because um, it can look like it's correct, but you're missing a parenthesis and such, and that's why, again, I recommend you open and close your parentheses right away. When I show you the, the, the feature that it'll close it for you, that'll be less of an issue. But I think in the beginning it's very important to understand that most of these things are paired, and you need to open them and close them. This is what it is so far. I'll get to the details about event and all of that a little later. But here, basically, we're saying we're going to, after we, after we see that they press submit, we're then going to run a function called fn save name, function save name, which doesn't exist. There's no function, there's no code in JavaScript built in called function save name. Because we want several things to happen. Retrieve those three boxes, process it, output it. There's nothing of that built in. So we're going to define our own function, function save name. And we've said before that HTML and CSS and JavaScript is processed from top to bottom, left to right. So here we're saying, let's run a function called function save name. This will cause an error. That doesn't exist yet. We're simply saying, after submit, run a function called function save name. But function save name does not exist. So we have to back up before the event listener and define what is what does function save name mean. <coughs> so define the function fn save name it is a series of steps that happen after an event a series of steps it is a series of code javascript code We should define it first before trying to use it or uh, run it or you might also hear it as invoke it. I have the 200 built-in JavaScript codes at my disposal. 
I have alert, I have prompt, I have confirm, I have different things. But I need certain things to happen. So I sort of have to invent or write my own code, my own functions, my own series of steps. This also technically creates an object. And so what we're going to do here is uh, define a function that has these steps. So we'll say function fn save name event curly braces. This is one of the few cases that we don't have a semicolon at the end. We've been adding a semicolon at the end of all of this JavaScript. Here's our command, end of statement. Up there, var, and then end of statement. Function is one of the ones that doesn't have a ending semicolon, and we can note it right here. Functions don't need an ending semicolon. You could write it and it'll work, but for example, some web browsers might give you an error say, that say redundant semicolon. So it's common to not put it there. When JavaScript was invented, someone said, oh, we don't need a semicolon there, and they all voted, and great, no semicolon. It would have been better that it would be there for consistency, and it does work oftentimes, but <coughs> it's common practice not to have it. We're going to divide up those curly braces, have some console output. We clicked the button. In theory, what, what we should be getting here is that once we Once we fill this stuff in and click go, we're going to get some output in the console. In theory, when we click submit, we'll run a function. We should see we click the button in the console view. It sort of works. Let me just show what's happening here. If I do run my latest code, and I press enter, you see for a moment it changed. Let me see. Pay attention really, really close there. I'll press enter. It changed for a moment. It did say something. The default behavior is that when we submit a form, usually it's being processed on a web browser. And usually, when we click Submit, and then it takes us to another screen, like a login welcome screen or something. So the default behavior is not fully programmed. What's happening is it is submitting, and it is saying we click the button, but it passes so fast. Because the default behavior is that it's, it's expecting to run on a web browser. We're not in a web browser. so. We need to back up one line before console log and say event dot prevent default. Stops the auto screen refresh. So save it and run it. If you're getting, we're going to do a break in a moment. If you're getting any errors, we want to fix those errors. If uh, it works, it should work something like this. You can type whatever you want at the moment and then click go. We click the button. Type stuff, click go, we click the button. If you're getting errors, we'll have a lot of time to troubleshoot, of course, but here's a possible errors. Um, if I type stuff in here and click go, you might get errors that appear red. If there is, um, if you look on the right side of the line of of that output, there should be a number, and that number should be telling you where to go look in your code to see where your error might be. So I might have a line. I might have an error on line forty-seven. 
So line 46, 47, you know, I go, I go down there, I might find the error. So as we do more of the coding, I'll point out more of how to debug. <coughs> but right now what we've got here is a very, very simple piece of JavaScript. It might not seem like it if, you're ex if you don't have experience, of course. But we'll get much more complex. And all I want to see at the moment, before you take your break, make sure that the you get something like this that when you when you um, I'll do it this time in Chrome just to see a different output when you um, type something in you click go you should see the output of we clicked on the button it's telling me on line 47 I had that message and on line 69 I had that message and I see there, line 6, 9, right there. We click the button. If you're getting errors, see if it gives you a line number to go look at. It may give you some weird error about, you know, unknown property or some sort of esoteric message. The point is, it hopefully tells you a line number to go look at, and you may see a misspelling or something like that. So let's pause and do our break here. If it's not quite working, um, call me over. If it's working, take a break. It's 8.16. We'll be back at 8.26. Uh, 10 minutes, and then we'll, go, then we'll go on. And here's the code so far up to this point. I, of course, will be putting a copy of this code in the folder at the end of the day for you to confirm it. 